It's okay. It's okay. She, she can sit here. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm no. Sorry. No, it's not. Oh, sure. It's okay. It's okay. She doesn't know what she's doing. No, Hey Patrick, hey Nathan, hey Joanna, welcome. Merry Christmas. It's great to see you here. We have wonderful musicians here, and a Amen. guest musician, Arthur Noble Jr. Amen. is here. He's going to play an awful part for us. So we're going to sample it. Arthur, stand up so folks here. Good morning. Here he is. And we have John Shepard is with us today, another musician, and Erickson Amen. is here, Johnny's here, and Joanna's home. She's going to play Amen. with us, and Nathan, <laughs> and, and, and uh, Patrick. So Amen. here we are, and now... <laughs> You are the choir. Amen. You are the choir. We have to start out with, uh, if you have your bulletin, turn to the back of it, and we'll start out with the come on, ring the bells. Did everybody get bells? I don't want any bells in the basket. Everybody has to have bells. Everybody got bells? Are all the bells taken? Go get a bell if there's a bell out there. And we'll start out with the chorus of come on, ring the bells. Musicians is on the back of, of the large mm -hmm. paper. Okay. Somebody got one? Okay. Here it is. Where is the present dog? In the back of the big table. I have a Christmas tree. Oh, you have a Christmas tree? How come I have? Let's see what I have. I have a Christmas tree. Oh, okay. No, no. I'll walk you on the morning. I'm eager to hear you. This is a very nice church. I'll tell you. If there wasn't any confusion, it wouldn't be Christmas. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Everybody got your bells? Let me hear your bells.
know, put your bells down, do not take them home. <laughs> but does anybody have a Santa Claus bell? Anybody look at your bell at the top of it. Is a Santa Claus on one of them? Anybody? Your bell should have a Santa Claus. Oh, Shannon has one. You get the nutcracker. All right, the nutcracker's up here waiting for a good call. So we're so happy. All right, now, uh, another song that we like to sing is, uh, at, at this time of the year, is uh, O Tannenbaum. The words are printed on the back of your bulletin. You see it here? Anybody got the music up here? Uh, o Christmas Tree? Here it is. Got it? Everybody got it? Got it? Okay. okay. See, these are not in the book, so I have to print them. You all have it? Everybody ready? Oh, and, and we've changed the words a little bit to make it um, the more the way I want it to be. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Where are the words printed? Uh, the words are printed uh, on the insert. Watchmen, tell us of the night. You know, you know, I have a quirky business about me. I like positive, happy songs, but I also like the kind that are kind of a little serious in the minor key. So, Watchmen, tell us of the night is written to a great, a great song tune, and it's called Aberystwyth. Try spelling that sometime without looking. Aberystwyth, and uh, we'll sing it together. That's a Welsh tune. Let's sing together, Watchmen Tell Us of the Night. Watch the signs of promise. 
return, please, and we'll sing number 288 in your book. We three kings of Ori and Ar, hold the chorus until verse 4, so that we don't go way over time this morning. 288.
Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the grace of God the Father, the love of God the Son, the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide here in this place, in this hour, touching our hearts and opening our spirits to things eternal, reminding us that all is well. We are in the superior hands of a God who has never failed. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, who brings glory to the Father by the wonderful rapture of the souls of those who now sing alleluias, who once cursed the living God, who lived in darkness and sin. But you revealed yourself to us, not coming as an emperor or glorious king, but you came as a babe to be one with us. How we praise you for that. Our Father, we confess to you that the ways you have dealt with our lives are like the twisted threads of a tapestry. We have not understood. We have oftentimes cursed the way things were happening, and yet you are planning for the front side to be seen one day, and we shall not judge you, but we shall praise you. Even the inconveniences, the sorrows, the great moments of sadness, the moments when we felt so abandoned and so lonely, even these played a part to bring us closer to the reality of our great Father in heaven and who you are and of your great love. So today we bless you, we worship you, we join with churches around the world in this celebration of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us at this hour. Forgive us our sins, there are many. We have not done the things we should have done. We've left on things that, that we should have done, but we've done things we should not have done. So, oh God, for thy great name's sake and for the mercy of your son, Jesus, remind us that all is well, our sins are covered. That to leave this world, to be absent from the body, is immediately to be present with the Lord. Oh, how we thank you for that assurance of salvation which your children may have. Now hear us as we pray the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and welcome. So if you can, would you stand where you are and give somebody a greeting? Merry Christmas. God loves you, so do I. Merry That's Christmas. That's a wonderful way to greet people. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Erickson. Merry Christmas. Greetings, digital people. Merry oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. some things that need to be done. Uh, he, he's, he's an expert. Spent 18 months in Vietnam 
invited by the Roman Church in Vietnam as they dedicated the great organ that was going to be in the, the cathedral church in Not uh, called Notre Dame. So he spent time there setting up a music program. He wow. knows all about the Crystal Cathedral organ, the Hazelwright organ, the organ, the Rafati that's down in Coral Ridge. He had an instrumental hand in a lot of these organs around wow. this town. So we were going to welcome uh, Arthur Noble this afternoon, but at the same time, he's going to play it's just an offertory here when we get ready for to receive tithes and wow. offerings. If you're visiting today, if you don't sign a bulletin or a card, then I won't know who you are. But if you sign it and put it in the offering plate, then I can send you a letter of welcome. It's just a brief little card. You're not on a mailing list, but you'll get a, a note of a welcome and we'll be so happy uh, to greet you. Other announcements are listed for you in the bulletin. Please take a look at that. Year-end offering envelopes uh, are, are a part of the the mainstay and the stability of our church to begin the new year. So I certainly hope that you'll take advantage of that and uh, we'll be blessed and so will you. You cannot outgive God. Uh, Shoebox stockings are all due today. If you don't bring it in today, bring it in tomorrow. If you forgot it, put it on the bench outside Warner Hall over here and we'll pick it up. They have to be delivered. And if we don't have them all in, somebody, a veteran in a very wonderful place uh, won't have anything to open. So that's why we are asking that they all be brought back in on time. Uh, and uh, of course, other announcements are in the bulletin. Take a look at the birthdays and anniversaries, and then January is coming up, Christmas is coming up. We're going to have a great time here. So I hope that you'll avail yourself of these opportunities. I think that covers most of the announcements. If I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, but we're going to sing the next song, and it's called 284, The Birthday of the King. And then we'll have our tithes and offerings. It's 200, uh, 284. 284. <laughs> So with bountifully shall have an abundant harvest. O oh God, make us to be believers 
in the invisible strings that you pull to provide for us. Bless the gifts we bring to you in tithes and offerings for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, give Mr. Arthur Noble a greeting, would you please? <laughs> teach us more about his lovely name. Hear our prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may Amen. be seated. I forgot the commercial. <laughs> Pick up a box of offering envelopes when you leave. And be sure to uh, put your name on the first one that you put in the offering in the new year. And that will establish your account with us. And then you can keep a record of it. Beautiful offering envelopes. There's a $50 bill in one of them. We won't tell you which one. So. <laughs> Pick it up when you, when you leave. Uh, so glad that you're here. Listen to the reading of the Word of God. You all know the Christmas story recorded, of course, so wonderfully in Matthew. Now, he writes from Joseph's side of the family, and Luke writes from Mary's side of the family. Where did they get their information? Well, remember, Luke was with the Apostle Paul. Paul had spent three years with Jesus, and we believe that maybe... They, they, Luke got some of the information from Paul, who got it from Jesus about these things, but also Mary uh, was able to speak about it and tell people about it as uh, the child Jesus was growing up in Nazareth. But don't forget, Joseph had other children. He had Simon and Joseph, and he had uh, uh, two other uh, young men that, that were his children because he, they were born after Jesus was born. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. But then it says he knew her not until the child Jesus was born. Then there was a regular family. And also brothers and sisters. They said, are not 
your mother and brother, are they're outside calling you. And he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? He who does the will of my father in heaven, the same to me as a relationship, close relationship, as a mother and a father uh, and, and brothers and sisters. So we come then to Luke's gospel and uh, Matthew writes about Joseph, Luke writes about Mary. Where do the kings come from? They came from Matthew's gospel because he's writing about Joseph's royalty. And whether they were kings or magi, it makes no difference. They were wise men from the east, they came. And then what's in Mary's side of the family? She's humble, humble Mary. So we're gonna read about shepherds today. Let's listen to this wonderful story. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now the manger could be made out of wood, could be made out of stone. What was Joseph's profession? What was his business? He was a car. I, can you see him fiddling around, putting the wood together, cleaning out the manger? And so she laid him in a manger because the manger, there was no room in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christos Kurios, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. There are so many Christmas stories that, that will bless our hearts. So I've selected this one because I think I'm putting together several thoughts that will run concurrently, hopefully. Uh, we, we have this time of the year we're all touched with what Christmas can mean to us. And I, I'm wondering, do you have a favorite Christmas carol? At this time of the year, we always have favorite Christmas carols. I know Betsy's favorite Christmas carol is, is once in Royal David City. She loves that song. Do you have one? Is it Silent Night? You remember Silent Night was first performed in a little church back in, I think it was 1812, Franz Gruber. He was uh, the priest of the church. And he had written this song for midnight mass. And when they got in there, the organ didn't work. The organ didn't work. The rats had eaten out the leather stops. And so what did he do? The first time Silent Night was sung, was sung with a guitar. He implemented, that's one of the stories of Christmas. Be ready and be loose enough to implement. Be expecting things that you don't expect. Anything can happen. I had a flat tire this week. I've never had a flat tire. I had a flat tire this week, but what really galled me is they didn't know who I was. <laughs> when I called AAA, they didn't know, I, do you know who I am? It didn't mean anything to them. It didn't cut any, well anyway, they told me, we're sending you a text. They didn't really know how dumb I am. I can't be on the phone and get a text to go back to the conversation. So I went back online and redialed the number. When I redialed the number, they said, Due to the large number of calls coming in, your call will be answered in the order that it was received. If you'd like to receive a text, I uh, don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there waiting in line, and suddenly a man came on and said, Hello, AAA, this is so and so. And I said, I, I have a flat tire. I said, And he knew where I was. The telephone, <laughs> listen, this is a scary world we're living in. <laughs> they know where you are. I leave my car in, in the I leave my phone in the car if I go into a shady place like a, a tap room or, or <laughs> any place where spirits are served. <laughs> because you know you don't want to know a minister who's a little tipsy. <laughs> Although sometimes it helps preaching. <laughs> and so, uh, but they, so then he said 45 minutes. So I waited 45 minutes. He came and he said, "Do you have a spare?" I almost said, "What is a spare?" <laughs> I, I've never seen it. The old days I knew where it was, it was in the trunk of the car. But it's a Sienna and the spare, they tucked it underneath. Can you imagine me down on my belly looking under the car to see if I had a spare? No, I said, I think I do, but I've never used it. Well, the man came out, very nice guy. He came down, he got down there, he saw it, and then he wanted to know, do I have a plug? 
to screw the thing to make the wheel go down so he could, I said, I have no idea. He found it and he put all the, what we used to call a donut. He put the donut on, but I couldn't take, I could not carry Arthur around in a car that had a donut. So as soon as <laughs> I could, I went to my mechanic, which is always busy and keeps your car for three days for anything. And he said, drive right in. So the Lord was with me, went right in. He took off the donut, he plugged the, the car, the, the wheel, and, and here I am. And that reminds me of a wonderful Amen. story how the Lord intervenes. Amen. She had moved into a neighborhood, she was not very wealthy, but she loved the Lord. And this dear sweet soul, when she'd come out every morning, see the sun, and she'd say, oh, praise you, Lord. But she was awake and she was alive. Praise you, Lord. But her neighbor was an atheist. Mm. And he would shout, there is no God. And she would say, you'll see. He went back in the house. Now, as it happened, her checks were late. Social Security, pension, whatever. And she really, she ran out of food. So she went out she said, praise you, Lord. But Lord, you know, I need eggs, I need butter, I need milk, I need bread, just the staples, Lord, to get me by. Uh, Lord, you know, I would like a little orange juice. Uh, and Lord, I'm telling you because you care. And the next morning she went out and there in a brown bag, grocery bag from Publix, was the eggs and the bread. And, and, and she said, oh, praise you, Lord. And the fellow said, there is no God. I bought your groceries. <laughs> and she looked at him and she said, praise you, Jesus. You not only answered my prayer, gave me the groceries, you made the devil pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> favorite songs at Christmas time, our favorite passages of scripture. Uh, Norman Rockwell, I like the way he, he has a Christmas painting in the church and two little choir boys. See, we're imperfect in this world, aren't we? we nobody wants to hold themselves up and just say, look to me. Um, I don't even, the apostle Paul would it like this, follow me, he said, as I follow Christ. In other words, if you see Christ in me, follow me. But every Christian should be so grounded so that if the person who led them to Christ should fall away, their faith wouldn't be rocked. Their faith would be steady. And so Norman Rockwell's great painting there, it is the church choir with all the children all dressed up ready for church. And in the choir, he's got a picture of two little choir boys. One has the right eye black and the other one has the left eye black. The little choir boys have been fighting before they got there. They're ready to kill each other. So it's not a, it's not a perfect world. Now, we come here to the, the first carol of Christmas when the angels came. That's the, really the first Christmas carol. Uh, there are other times when the angels, now somebody said, do angels sing? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that angels sing. However, by juxting around a few little thoughts there, you can make them sing. For instance, God says to Job, where were you when I created the world? Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you know where I control the sea? Do you know the levers and the controls for all the world? Imagine what our world is like. And then he said, where were you when the sons of God sang and the stars of God shouted for the glory? I may have gotten that backwards. But we think that the sons of God and the angels of God and the stars of God, it's just talking about the heavenly host. So I do think angels can sing. And they have a wonderful time when they sing. Imagine what the choir is supposed to be like. But of course, there's an old country song and it says, there is singing up in heaven such as we've never heard. And it goes on to say this, uh, the angels have such beautiful tones and voices. It says, but when I sing, when we get to heaven, we will be able to sing. When I sing, they will fold their wings for I'm singing about redemption. But when I sing redemption story, they must fold their wings, for ne angels never knew the joy that our salvation brings. Mm. So there's great singing up in heaven. And when you sang the doxology, do you remember the line in the doxology? Praise him above all ye heavenly hosts. Mm. Well, that's angels, but it's also the citizens who have lived on earth and are now in the glory. Mm. We call them the saints in heaven. Mm. Uh, I want to just take a word here about when the angel made this, unto you is born this day. That's a, that's a singing song. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, the king's city, a savior who is Christos Kurios. 
Now, there are some people who do not believe Jesus is very God of very God. Even though Isaiah says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father, and of the increase of his government there shall be no end. These are titles that would be given to the Messiah. And so when the angel says to them, uh, you know, he is born Christos Kurios, it's all nominative. He is Christ the Lord. If it was Christos Kuriu, that would have been in the genitive, and it would mean this. David was the Lord's king. The Messiah would be the Lord's Messiah. But it's not. It's not genitive. It's nominative. So the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong, and the Mormons are wrong, dead wrong. Christ is God right. in the flesh. Right. Understand it all. If you can, you would be God. Only God can comprehend God. Mm. We cannot. That's why we sang that song. Mm. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, mm. enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes. We can't comprehend all. But when I go to the seashore over here and I see, I see the Atlantic Ocean and I see the intercoastal, but I see the Atlantic Ocean out there. It's beautiful, it's wonderful to see that, especially if it's calm on a calm day and the sailboats are out and the boats are going by, that's wonderful. Do I see all of the Atlantic Ocean? No. But what I see, all I see is the Atlantic Ocean. So we don't see all of God, but what you do see in Christ is all of God that you can see. Mm. He's in our limelight so we can see him. But I wanna talk quickly about who we are in this uh, in this world, and then talk about some of the contrasts. And I think that that would be a, a help to us. Time is running on, and I want us to get a good nap before we come back this afternoon. <laughs> I want to, well. I think I'll, I'll just sk skip some of it here and just talk about. Yes, I do think angels sing, and I, and I think it's lovely what they do. But here's some of the things about Christmas. The eight the eight contrasts of Christmas or the parallels of Christmas. Now, when I tell you this, I would like to say that I made this up or I did this all on my own, but I'm the world's number one plagiarist. When I get to heaven, they will say, and now the plagiarist award goes to, and, I, and that's the one I'll win. Because if somebody says something good, I try to give them credit. Now, I can give credit to this because it was Donald Gray Barnhouse from the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, a great scholar, a wonderful preacher. And then he was followed by, and when the Lord took Book Donald home, by James Boyce. And he was an outstanding Bible teacher, wrote the Bible Study Fellowship for the women's groups. And so I'm repeating then what they said, but at the same time, it's so fresh and it's so good. Here are the things that, the contrast of heaven and the joy that we have. First of all, Jesus descended in order that he might raise us up from our lowly position of birth to his glory. Now, here are the contrasts. The first contrast is Luke chapter 2, 11. Today in the city of David is born a savior who is Christ the Lord. And I just told you that that's Kurios Christos. It's all in the nominative, Christ who is the Lord. Not Christ of the Lord, not the Lord's Christ, but Christ the Lord. And John 1, 12 says this, to all who receive him, to them he gave the power to become sons of God. That means that Jesus underwent a human birth so that we who believe in him can have a spiritual birth. Some people say this, when I talk to them and they're, they're trapped in some sin of some sort, they say, God made me this way. I, or they, they use this phrase, I was born like this. Oh, don't try to change me, I was born like this. And I say, you were. That's why you need to be born again. <laughs> because the way you are is not good. And the spiritual birth, God enables us to have a new impetus, a new life in us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen always overnight. Sometimes it does. A person who's an alcoholic, a total drunk, they meet the gospel and suddenly their lives are changed. That's wonderful. But many people, they have to work on it. They have to go to AA all the rest of their lives. That's fine. That's very good. The second, the second contrast is this. Mary laid the newborn Christ in a manger because there was no room in the inn. But John 1, uh, 14, 2 says this, in my father's house, <laughs> in my father's house, there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, and he suffered the fact as in, in, in this world of not having a due place for him 
in order that he might prepare for us for a, a higher place. So we're not going to be somewhere in a place where there's no room. When you knock at heaven's door, they're not going to say, there are many trying to call, please wait, and your call will be, no, we're not going to get any of that. They're going to say, welcome, come right in. You know, another wonderful thing about the angels is, who brought this message, angels don't envy us. They're happy for us. They, and they don't envy each other. They're different grades of, they're not a family. Angels are not related. Each one is an individual being from what we get from scripture. And they have orders of angels. They're the angels, the archangels, the cherubim, the seraphim. They're grades of angels. When you die, you don't become an angel. The first meaning of the word angel means messenger. And so Christ is sometimes called the messenger of the Lord because he is the one who conveys the heart of the Father, the heart of the Trinity. And so the third thing is, uh, we're going to have a heavenly mansion and he's going to prepare a place for us. Think how wonderful that's going to be. The third thing is Matthew chapter 2 verse 12 and Galatians 3 verse 26. The Bible says that when they came into the house, this is the wise men, when they came into the house, they found a child with Mary uh, and his mother and of course Joseph was there too. That when they came in, but Galatians 3 26 says, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He became a member of the human family that you might be, become a member of his eternal family. You might be a member of the God, God's family. I like Luke 2 verse 51. He went down to Nazareth and was obedient to them. You know the story. They were on their way home from a big meeting, big church meeting down in Jerusalem. They were getting up here, and they said, well, I, is Jesus with you? No, I thought he was with you, 12 years old. Well, where is he? And they thought he was with the cousins and walking up, but he wasn't anywhere. They ran back to Jerusalem. They came into the Royal Palm Cathedral Church, and they saw <laughs> Jesus disputing with the elders. He was talking to them of the prophecies. And so they said, why have you done this to us? And remember his reply? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Mm. And I love that. But then it says, and he went back home and he was submissive to them. Mm. In other words, he didn't want to put them through any turmoil. They said, why have you put us through this? <laughs> and, hello, if you're babysitting, it's one thing if the child disappears for a while. But if you're the caretaker for God's son, you're in trouble mm -hmm. if you lose the child. So Jesus said he submitted to them in order that we might know real freedom. That means this. There are three roles that Jesus plays. He's the prophet. That means he foretells the things of God. He's the priest. He's the only priest in the New Testament who can make satisfaction for us. He's also the victim, the priest and the victim. And he's also the king. He's in control. Prophet, priest, and king. Three offices. Nobody in the Old Testament satisfied all three credentials. But Jesus did. Now, when he makes you free and you come to Christ, what do you do? First of all, you can know God's will for your life by reading the scriptures in prayer. And you submit yourself to him. Thy will be done. He'll close some doors. He'll open some doors. You submit to him. You are the prophet for your life. You're the priest for your life. How so? You do not need to come to me. I can pray for you, and we pray for one another. In that sense, there is the priesthood of all believers, but there is no clergy set apart today who can do anything for you as an intercessor other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So that way, you are your own priest. When you pray, you can come, you can come right into the very presence of God. And you don't come as a, as a criminal. The apostle tells us in Hebrews, let us come boldly into his presence. Why? Because God's not seeing you. He's seeing the righteousness of Christ. So we come boldly into his presence. And you are the king. You have a right over your own life. Freedom is the most important thing. And Jesus did this. He submitted to them and showed obedience and discipline in order that we might have the freedom because it is his life that he will give for us. And then fifthly, the Bible says, being in the very nature of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, not a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And so 1 Peter says this, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive crowns of glory. 
He emptied himself of the vestiges of royalty. But one day you will have crowns of glory. There will be rewards for you in heaven. Your good works do not earn you any place in heaven. Lay them aside. As long as you're trusting good works, you're not trusting completely in Christ. When you're trusting completely in Christ, you put your good works aside. Are they important? Yes. Now that you know Christ in appreciation, I want to please this one who loved me so. Now those good works count up. To what extent? <laughs> Jesus said, whosoever gives a glass of water in my name shall not go without their reward. Beloved, my greatest fear as a minister of the gospel is that I preach such an easy gospel that some of the saints relax too much and they're not practicing the good works that they could do. The good works that one day will give them reward and when they get to heaven, they will say, oh, those wings are beautiful. I'm sorry, they're not for you. Oh, that halo, it is written. No, that's not. You get a rusty old halo and secondhand wings <laughs> if you don't have good works. So you want to do good works because you love Christ and you love people. That's what we're working on. Sixth, he had no place to lay his head. That's what the Bible says. But look what he says to us, that through his poverty, we are made rich. Oh, are we ever rich. We have a hope beyond this world. We believe that God has loved us with an everlasting love. And the seventh the contrast is, in his birth, who did he welcome? Shepherds. In his birth, he welcomed the shepherds at the angelic news, and they hurried and they found others to tell about it. But Luke chapter 15, verse 10 says, on the occasion of our second birth, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. If the angels of God, when you claim Christ as your Savior and Lord, and submit to his Lordship, the Bible says it is rejoicing in heaven. When you see the rejoicing in heaven, when you leave this world, if you don't think that they're excited to welcome you, you don't know the story. Here's what Peter says, the apostle. For thus shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance. That's the moment I die, the moment I'm alive. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, says Paul. For he says it's very far better to be with Christ. And he says, the moment you leave this body and are there, you will see the entrance richly supplied unto you. That means no, nothing spared. The trumpets are playing. If there's music in heaven, they're all singing because the angels are happy to welcome you. But Jesus had no place to lay his head here, but we do. And finally, the eighth one is this. Herod sought to destroy Jesus. Jesus was pursued by this evil ruler and even by the religious people of his day. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, But remember that he might destroy the works of the devil. He might destroy the far more dangerous evil, and that is the devil, who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he moves about. Look what he's doing in the east and all these countries. 22 countries are at war, killing one another. That's the devil's work, because he hates man. And he tricks people. He promises them diamonds and pearls, and they're all fake, they're all costume jewelry. And so many people sell themselves only to realize, I live my whole life for nothing. Somebody died with a great wealth, and when they died with great wealth, people at the cemetery said, oh, how much was he worth? And the answer is worth nothing. He mm. left it all behind. Mm. The hearse never follows, the, is never followed by the bank car. It's sad. So live for him and rejoice in Christmas. Now I'm going to close with a poem. You are who you are for a reason. You're a part of God's intricate plan. You're precious and perfect, a unique design. You're called God's special woman or man. You look like you look for a reason. God, our God made no mistake. He knit you together in the womb. You're just what he wanted to make. The parents you had were the ones he chose. Good or bad. The parents you had were the ones he chose. And no matter how you may feel, they were custom designed with God's plan in mind, and they bear the master's seal. No, that trauma you faced was not easy, and God wept that it hurt you so, but it was allowed to shape your heart that into his likeness you grow. You are who you are for a reason. 
You are formed by the master's rod. You are who you are, beloved, because there is a God. Let's pray right. together. Amen. Thank you, Father, for bringing us to this day of celebration. Help us to enjoy it and keep it to right, to be thankful for all the things you do, and to remember that it's all about you and your love for us. Jesus is the reason for the season, Lord. We know that, but we're the reason Jesus came. So to that end, bless us all because we've been here and make us all to be happy and joyful Christians, even in the worst circumstances, knowing that this is not the whole story. This is the underside of the tapestry where the threads are all tangled, but you're making a wonderful picture out of our lives. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna close with a closing hymn this morning, and we're just singing two stanzas of the hymn, which is 273, Good Christians all rejoice, not good Christian men, good Christians all rejoice, and stanzas two and three only of this closing hymn, 273. upon you means the smile of his face he's not angry with you and may he help you hear his words whispered deep in your soul where only you and God live well done good and faithful servant I see you struggling in the midst of the mystery of life be not afraid I am in the midst and I am in the mystery and may God give you his perfect peace through Jesus Christ our Lord amen Stand with me and let's sing together because he lives I can face tomorrow.